going to talk about the fourth period of AP World. So we're talking uh, what years? 1450. Good. 1450 to 1750. Remember that historians develop these years. Historians develop these years because they're 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 organization pieces, right? They're never perfect organization pieces, but there's usually something that's happening at, like, the end or the beginning, and then there's something that's happening at the other end or the beginning of the next one, right? And so for 1450 to 1750, what kind of things do we want to think about um, that are maybe happening at, at the start, maybe coming to an end, and then what's going to maybe uh, persist throughout, and then what's going to kind of be different about the next period? Yes, ma'am. Very good. So that's going to be like the next period after. So the Industrial Revolution is uh, 1750 and after. So that's a nice bookend to this period. Uh, Cece? European and American. Very good. Very good. So that's kind of uh, during this, uh, this duration. So uh, uh, connecting world. Let's call it connecting worlds, right? So we're going to have old world and new world come together for the first time since, I don't know, uh, ancient North or ancient Asians walked across a land bridge uh, from, from Asia. Yes? Very good. We're going to have a Renaissance period at the beginning. So that's, that's um, uh, uh, just a Western European thing. So we'll fit that in there. And I'm so happy that you can join us for Mr. Crossan's class so you can freely say Renaissance and not have to hear me say Renaissance. Isn't that annoying? Yeah. Yes? Very good. Okay, so Connecting Worlds is going to come with the Columbian Exchange. Let's think, what about uh, 1450? Uh, it's, it's a nice round number to create, and, and we're going to always think 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. So the beginning of this connection between worlds. Um, but what else is happening right around 1450? Yeah. Very good. The fall of Constantinople, the, the end of the Byzantine Empire. So really, the, the Ottoman Empire grows in the late 1300s, but really now it's becoming a dominant force in, um, in Southwest Asia and in Eastern Europe. Um, what else are we going to see? Yeah. Okay, so Europeans are going to be venturing overseas. Um, obviously making their way into the Americas, but then also hopping into, uh, into Asia, uh, entering into the Indian Ocean trade network. Excellent. Speaking of which, trade networks. There's going to be the four that persist, right? If you had to write about a continuity in trade uh, from, like, let's say you're given years like 1000 to 1750. If you have to write about continuities in trade, we could say there are four trade routes that are going to persist throughout this entire period, and those four trade routes would be Silk Roads, Trans-Saharan, Mediterranean Sea Lanes, and Indian Ocean Sea Lanes. Very good. These are the ones that have always been with us since the classical period. And then the change is now to bring in the transatlantic system. Awesome. What else? What are some other big ideas that are going to fit into this period? Yes. Okay, a mercantilist economic theory. The idea that, that, we, that there's a finite amount of wealth in the world and we need to protect our own nation's wealth. Yes? We're going to have a scientific revolution in Western Europe. Wow, we're really living in Europe, though. And, and it's, it shouldn't be surprising, right, um, that, that we're, this is so becoming Eurocentric by 1450 to 1750 because this is the period where, where Europe is going to begin to dominate more of the world, at least. We've got to wait till 1750 to 1900 to dominate, really, most of the world. But certainly they're going to be, be taking more. Another one that we've got to get, like, the, the end of the previous to be to the, the beginning of the new is going to be the end of the Mongol empires. All right, the Mongols are going to have their heyday in the 12 and into the 1300s uh, in China, but the Mongols are really a thing of the past. All right, the Black Plague, remember, that's going to have its its impact in the previous period as well. But the Black Plague bringing an end to European feudalism or contributing to the end of European feudalism. So by the time we get to 1450, we've kind of got something new going in Europe. We've got the rise of more centralized kingdoms rather than decentralized feudal states. Yeah. Uh, we're we're going to get the gun, let's, let's call them the gunpowder empires, right? Uh, during this period, the rise of the gunpowder empires. And we remember where the gunpowder come from? Very good. And thanks to the Mongols, it's going to spread to the West, and we will have uh, states in India 
and in, in present day Iran, Persia, and obviously the Ottoman Empire, who are going to be able to harness this gunpowder technology and use it to dominate their rivals. Um, the Ottoman Empire even can use it to, to start to bring down the Byzantine Empire, right? Uh, so the gunpowder empires, there are three Islamic empires uh, during this period. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Um, and then I, I think we're also leaving out one other change. Uh, a continuity? Yes, ma'am. Say it. There, there absolutely is going to be new forms of social organization. We're going to see that in the Americas especially uh, with the development of a caste system in, in Spanish America. But um, the, the, the continuity that I wanted to talk about is uh, there's always been forced labor around the world, right? Slavery is not an invention of this time period. So slavery, and even, even African slavery, um, uh, slaves coming from the, the sub-Saharan West Africa, that's always been a thing, Right? But what changes during this period? What are we going to see begin 1450 to uh, 1750? Yes, ma'am. Now it's more harsh and less like part of the family and more like... Okay, so the nature of slavery is going to change in some respects. Um, and the, the direction of the slavery is also going to change. Whereas previous sub-Saharan African slaves tended to go north to the Arab world. Now they're going to go west across the Atlantic uh, to the Americas. All right? So these are the big ideas that we want to get. Just to, So we've got our periodization down. And if you can drop those ideas into a paper that encompasses these years, you're going to be golden. You're going to be getting some points out of it. So um, let's kind of run through really quick. 4-1. 4-1 uh, starts the same place as 3-1 and starts the same place as 2-1. It's all about the trade. All right, All about the trade. Trade during this period is going to intensify. There's going to be even more than we'd had before. Do we notice uh, from the from the classical from the pre-classical period on, human beings create more, we trade more. We create more, we trade more. We create more, we trade more. So there's going to be an intensification. I like to use that word, an intensification of global trade. These tra or the amount of, of goods traded on whether it be Trans-Saharan or the Indian Ocean or the Mediterranean, now the Transatlantic coming in, and then the Silk Road. All of these are still going to continue to exist. Uh, collectively, we will see more trade going across regions than we ever had before in human history. Now, we're going to have a couple of these trade routes start to diminish in importance. Um, during 1450 and 1750, which trade routes are going to start to, like, wane in their importance and, and global trade? Yes, ma'am, Ms. Taylor. Very, the land routes tend to. Very good. Uh, the Trans-Saharan tends to lose out, especially in that slave trade business, to the Transatlantic. And the Silk Road trade routes. That, that Silk Roads are going to have their high point during the, uh, the Mongol rule in China. If the Mongols connect east to west and the Mongols make safer the Silk Road trade. But after the Mongols fall, the, uh, and, and certainly once the Europeans arrive in Asia. Remember, if you are a European that wants contact to Chinese goods before Europeans can sail themselves to the Indian Ocean, you've got to do business with these merchants in the middle. And, and these are Muslim merchants in the middle, and Europeans didn't, weren't very fond of doing that kind of business. You can, but that was all connected via the Silk Road. That was all connected via the Silk Road. Now that Europeans have found their own way to the east, they don't need to use that anymore. So Silk Road trade is going to decline. Trans-Saharan trade is going to decline. While Indian Ocean trade is going to skyrocket. And obviously, there was no transatlantic trade network that is going to develop and grow. Cool, yeah? Cool. Countries that we have to recognize that are going to have the most impact on, on these new trade routes that are going to develop, we have to start with Portugal and Spain. And really, we start with Portugal. Uh, Portugal has an important, wealthy, connected to money and connected to power uh, benefactor that is going to spur Portuguese and really European exploration on the open seas. And that guy is who? Henry the Navigator, Prince Henry the Navigator. And that's why uh, Mr. Freeman threw a little school on Portugal, because he opens up a school for navigators in Portugal to train these navigators on how to use the newest technology of the day to navigate the high seas. So from there, we see Portugal taking the initial lead on overseas trade and travel, right? Um, 
Two guys you should know, Bartolomeo Diaz and Bosco da Gama. Diaz is the guy that gets down around the southern tip of Africa, and he's like, oh my gosh, we can get around this thing. And he goes back and he lets everybody, including Vasco da Gama, know what he's done. Da Gama follows in his footsteps and makes it all the way to East Africa and then hops across to India. Coolio? Not long after uh, Bartolomeo Diaz, we're going to see a th the funding of the explorations of Christopher Columbus across the Atlantic Ocean. Of course, the hope was not to run into the Americas. They had no idea the Americas were there. The hope was to get to the riches of India, to get to the trade spice markets of India. Columbus is never going to make it there, but he does open the door for the Spanish to begin to go west uh, in order to get to the east. You should be familiar with some of the new technologies that navigators are able to use and they're going to learn to use in Prince Henry's school. So what kinds of things should be on our mind as we would drop in an evidence on maybe a short answer question or even a long essay question? Yes, David. The, the astrolabe. Very good. The astrolabe. Uh, yes. The magnetic compass. Very good. Not so much a technology, just a new understanding, but... To understand wind patterns, for example, the monsoon winds of India, and to understand ocean currents, um, to understand ocean currents uh, that, that exist, whether it be the Indian Ocean or in the South Atlantic, uh, so Europeans can better navigate those seas. Also, new ship designs. Uh, you should be familiar with the, uh, the Spanish Caravel. All right, I'd like you guys to know that. And the Caravel is going to use both traditional square sails or rectangular sails where the wind would push it from behind, but then also those triangular sails. And what did we use? Latin sails, very good, that Indian Ocean traders have long been using. Coolio? Questions, comments, concerns? All right. Uh, yes, ma'am? Diaz is the guy that travels from Portugal and makes it around the southern tip of Africa. And he's like, hey, you can make it. Otherwise, you have no far idea how far down that is. So you can get around Africa. And then Vasco da Gama follows in that, his footsteps and goes all the way around um, Africa to the east coast of uh, Africa and to India, ultimately. So he's the first white guy to land in India via ocean travel. Coolio? All right. Um, there's going to be some new developments uh, that will facilitate trade and, and, and be uh, 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 itself encouraging more trade during this time period. Yes, ma'am. Okay, very good. So we got new financial instruments uh, that, that are going to be used and also new instruments of states, like support of, of states in, in encouraging nations to trade. So we can start with joint stock companies. That's totally cool. Uh, and the biggest of the world is going to be the VOC. The VOC is the Dutch East India Company, um, but because they speak a different language, we're going to call it the VOC in their original. Uh, joint stock companies. They can pool the resources of many investors in order to grow their business even larger. Think, guys, think of like UPS or, or think of any trucking business, right? If, if you've got enough money to buy one big truck to deliver goods, you can deliver one truck of goods, I don't know, a day, however long it takes you to deliver one truck of goods. But if you've got enough money to buy two trucks... Well, now you can double the amount of goods. You can double uh, travel back and forth. If you can get three trucks, four, awesome. If we can find a way to get investments from thousands of people so we can buy even more delivery vehicles, not necessarily trucks now. Maybe we'll talk ships of, uh, of, of Europe in 15, 1600s. Now we can conduct even more trade. So the joint stock companies are able to get resources from, from the entire community or the entire nation or even outside of the nation sometimes as it's traded. You also want to think about banking and insurance. Western Europe is going to be on the forefront of developing uh, banking houses and insurance houses. These are places where uh, merchants and, and, and you know, entrepreneurs can get loans for their business endeavors. And they can also insure their, their property against loss. And if you're going to send a ship across an ocean, you better insure it. Because if it goes down, you would lose everything. With insurance, you get that backed up. So now we're going to have a couple things. We're going to have the growth of these joint stock companies, right, with more trade going back and forth across the open seas. But we're also going to have 
the growth of these new industries, banking industries, insurance industries, eventually stock market industries, like where we trade these, these commodities. Um, and as these grow, we're going to create a new middle class in Western Europe, right? Like new people getting connected to wealth that had never been connected to wealth before. And as they're bringing in money, what can they do with some of it? Invest it. You know, we kind of create like a little bit of a cycle here that helps everybody grow and, and be stronger. Cool, Leo? Cool. Um, I want you to think about the Spanish and their connection. Uh, they find a mountain full of silver in present-day Bolivia. It is called Potosi. Very good. P-O-T-O-S-I. So the, like, we have talked about having a money tree in our backyard, right? The Spanish literally find a money mountain in their empire. And they extract this silver uh, from, from their uh, colonies in South America. And they, they, they coin it and they start shipping it around the world and it enters global marketplaces. Now, what's it going to do to the value of global silver as they start mining more and more? It's going to bring it down, right? But silver is going to become the most important uh, medium of exchange, the most important currency around the world. The government in China, for example, uh, the, the, Ming, or pardon me, the Qing dynasty in China is going to only accept uh, silver as transactions and taxes and, and whatnot. All right? Cool. Um, I also want you to be familiar with uh, the connections uh, along the, uh, what we call a triangular trade system in the Atlantic Ocean. As a part of the Atlantic system, a triangular network of trade is going to develop. I know you guys already know this. Please don't think that this is the triangular trade system because there's not a the triangular trade. All triangular trade systems do is connect three endpoints of trade. So that can happen in a lot of, a lot of different places. Uh, the Atlantic one, though, is the one we know best, where finished goods from, the, uh, from Europe are going to go down to Africa and then be emptied off their ships, and the ships will be refilled with human cargo to travel across what's known as the Middle Passage of the Atlantic Ocean, and then they will be uh, sold at auction in the Americas, for, uh, and then the ships will be then refi refilled with the production of the Americas. Primarily, what kind of crops or what kind of goods? Sugar, primarily. Sugar and cotton, to a lesser extent, rum, uh, some of the byproduct of molasses, some of the byproducts of sugar. Be absolutely comfortable with the Colombian exchange. You've got to know things that are going from east to west and from west to east, or old world to new, new world to old. All right? Right off the bat, think about diseases going from the old world to the new world. Okay, that's, that's going to decimate the populations of the Americas. And then the foods that will go back and forth. Give me some uh, new world to old world. Yes, ma'am. Potatoes, very good. I like thinking of potatoes and corn together because they're both high calorie, very easy to grow crops that are going to have a tremendous impact on populations in the old world, right? What else is going to move? Yes, ma'am. Squash. Squash, very good. Pumpkins, awesome. What else? Yes, ma'am. Tobacco. Tobacco, very good. Tobacco is an American crop that's going to become very popular in Europe. Now let's go uh, the other way. Yeah. Um, oh. <laughs> um. Old world and new world. Okay, very good. Domesticated pack animals. Horses are a new thing in the Americas. Uh, cattle, goats, sheep, all of them are going to be new to the Americas. What do you want to say, Angel? Okay. Sugar, also. Like all the sugar cane that's going to be grown in the Americas um, as, as one of the most important cash crops. Uh, that'll make its way over. Um, citrus, bananas, grapes. That's kind of new. Cool. Okay, we're good. Um, know that old world populations are going to see tremendous growth because of this. So when we talk about the Columbian Exchange, it is very easy to remember the death of Native American populations. It's often harder to remember the growth of old world populations that will result. As people are mixing, as they're moving more, as people are mixing, we're going to have some new syncretic religions, right? Syncretism is when ideas come together and they make something new. So we're going to see new syncretic religions, not only in the Americas, but, but really around the world. Um, in some cases, we're going to see religions uh, blending previous ideas that were there. Uh, for example, uh, Sikhism in India. 
should know uh, Sikhism, S-I-K-H-I-S-M. A blending of some Christian, and, or pardon me, a uh, blending of some Hindu and Muslim ideas to develop a new religion in India. And then uh, in the Americas, we will see religions like Vodun and Santeria. Vodun um, is an African traditional, African traditional uh, religions blended with Roman Catholicism, particularly French Catholics. Uh, Santeria, we are going to see uh, in a place like Cuba, where again, African religions blending with Spanish Catholicism. I want you to think of uh, that movie Coco, which you probably have all seen to this point. Uh, Coco, which is going to be uh, like Roman Catholics in Mexico, but celebrating the Day of the Dead, celebrating traditional Aztec or, or Mexican religions, Mexican native religions that practice ancestor veneration, kind of a blending. So a Catholic in, uh, like you guys know, if, who's in Spanish class here? Okay, so when you guys celebrate Day of the Dead, your teacher probably makes very clear that this is a Mexican thing, this is not a Spanish thing, correct? Do they make that clear to you? Okay, good. They do their job then. We are going to also see the reform of religions that had long existed, all right, or some changes in religions that had long existed. In Islam, we're going to see new branches and interpretations of Islam, particularly a Sufism. Please remember Sufism or the Sufis. This is what we can call a mystical branch of Islam, Sufism, S-U-F-I-S-M. Sufism, a mystical branch of Islam that kind of separates um, the believer from the mosque and the imam, the leader of the prayer, and it's more of an individualized personal connection to the faith, right? And these Sufis will often travel uh, long distances and spread their interpretation of their religion uh, and help that religion of Islam move. In Europe, we'll see the development of a new branch of uh, Christianity in Western Europe as in 1517, the Roman Catholic Church will split with the uh, Protestant Reformation. Okay, So the Protestant churches are going to be brand new sects of, of Christianity um, resisting or rejecting some of the interpretations of, um, of um, pardon me, the Roman Catholic Church. Cool, Leo? All right, press on. And talk a little bit about um, period two, uh, 4.2. This is new social organizations, new labor systems that will develop during this period. I want you to think about um, the different types of labor that are going to be used, in particular coerced labor, how people are like made to do work for, for others. We're going to have a tremendous growth in what's called chattel slavery. So please recognize and connect chattel slavery with that cha transatlantic slave trade, chattel. Chattel slavery is slavery as property, when, when someone actually owns another human being. We'll also see an increase in indentured servitude. Since there's going to be so much more trade and so much more travel across long distances, across long ocean travel, um, that, that trip is expensive. And some people will pay for their trip across an ocean by providing a, a, a certain amount of time of their labor going forward. You guys learned probably last year a lot about British subjects paying maybe seven years of their labor for a trip across the Atlantic Ocean. It's an expensive trip across the Atlantic Ocean. So that's indentured servitude, and we'll see that grow during this period. In the Americas, see a couple different systems grow. First, the encomienda in, in uh, Central America. The encomienda system, where the king of Spain will grant a plot of land to a peninsulare, maybe one of the conquistadors that had conquered that land. And he'll grant a plot of land, and the Native Americans that live within that land will become his forced labor force. In South America, the Spanish are going to adopt what system of the Inca that the Inca previously used? The Mita system, very good, where, where Native Americans would be forced to give up maybe a period of their year to service to the Spanish Empire. Just like previously um, under the Inca Empire, they were forced to give up a period of their year for the Inca. We're going to see some new um, social classes develop during this period. In Latin America, again, we've got the castas, the, the caste system in Spain. Who's at the top of that mountain? We mentioned this today in class, guys. Peninsulares, very good. Who's under the peninsulares? 
Very good. And this came up in class early, in my class earlier today. Uh, the Creoles, um, the, uh, the, the Latin American revolutions that start with Simon Bolivar, that's a revolution of the Creoles, those sons and daughters of the Peninsular, well, sons of the Peninsular. Um, we're going to see uh, a new elite in China in the mid-1600s as the last Chinese empire is born. Who, what's the last Chinese dynasty? Shang Zhou Chin, not Shang Zhou Chin, not Sweet Tang Song, Sweet Tang Song, Wan Ming, Qing Republic, Qing Dynasty. Where are they from? Manchuria. So they're Manchus. So now, once the Qing Dynasty conquers China, there's a Manchu elite. Like you are better in Chinese society if you are Manchu, or at least you're seen as better. You're at the top of society. And then we're going to see in Europe, and this is kind of interesting. And it's going to, in part, develop out of new ideas like the growth of joint stock companies and banking and insurance, a new urban elite that will grow in Western Europe. We sometimes use the word gentry uh, for this like upper crust of European society. But what is new here, from 1450 to 1750, we don't have feudal Europe anymore. Like, eh, there's still traditional nobles. Uh, but we don't have, like, the wealthy guys who own land, and they are the only wealthy folks in society. Now there's other wealthy folks around. And in some cases, kings are even going to go so far as to sell titles of nobility to some of these wealthy folks that have developed their, their, uh, their wealth through other means. All right, It's not just land ownership anymore. So we can call these guys the European gentry, the new, like, upper crust of European society. All right? Questions, comments, concerns from anyone? All right. For 4.3, the empires that are going to grow, the states that are going to grow that we need to be concerned with. Um, got a few uh, different things to talk about here. First, how do empires and how do states legitimize their right to rule? How do they get seen? How are they seen as legitimate? A number of states will use religion to make that connection. All right? Give me a country or a state or an idea that uses religion to claim legitimacy. Yes, ma'am. Very good. In China, the traditional mandate of heaven. The gods want us to rule, and so we get to rule. Now, please note, though, um, with regard to the mandate of heaven, we usually... That is, at least my understanding of it, that's a little bit separate from, like, what anybody has control. Like, Chinese emperors, um, they, I think the mandate of heaven works much better when you're, like, looking back at what has happened. It explains how we got to this point. So, for example, if there's, like, horrible earthquakes or outside invasions or whatever, people would talk around at the water cooler in China and be like, hey, man, he must have lost the mandate of heaven because all these bad things are happening now. That works a little bit different than we're going to see in Western Europe. What's the, what's the Western Europe connection with religion and power? Yes? Um, right. Very good. Know the phrase divine right of kings. And think of a king like Louis XIV. Louis XIV doesn't follow any like divine right of heaven or Confucian relationship where the ruler must be benevolent and good and the people must follow the ruler. What does Louis XIV say with regard to his power as a king of France? I'm absolute. No one on earth can challenge me. Who is the only person that can challenge Louis XIV? God. And God hasn't taken Louis off the throne. Louis is going to be on the throne for like 70 years. He starts as a very little boy. So Louis is going to be there for his whole life. No one, God ain't messing with him, so no one else can mess with Louis XIV. So divine right of kings. Please also recognize, and here I want to look at the divide between the Ottoman Empire, the Ottoman Empire, which is going to be like right here, and the Safavid Empire that's going to be right here. The Ottoman Empire is based on the religion of Sunni Islam. They're, they're the branch of Sunni Islam. Whereas the Safavid Empire, they're Shia Islam. Do we remember the, the original divide between Sunni and Shia? It happened right at the beginning of our, of our Islam story, right? Uh, someone new, give me a new voice. Why, why does Islam split? Yes, ma'am. It's Fidel. Um, Very good. So, 
you can say the, the word Shia literally means the, the follower of Ali. Uh, so Ali was Muhammad's son-in-law. So the Shia think to be the caliph, to be the successor to Muhammad, you've got to be in this line of Ali. Whereas the Sunnis say it can be anybody that the, that the Ummah, the, the religious community, supports. All right? So right off the bat in Islam, we've got this split. That split manifests itself politically in that the Ottoman Empire, Sunni. The Safavid Empire, Shia. And I would love for you to remember, if you can today, like the Safavid Empire is like the continuation of the Persian states. Um, and today that's the country of Iran. And today the country of Iran is Shia Islam, predominantly Shia Islamic. Um, let's not forget about the religion in the Americas, the Aztec religion. The idea of practicing human sacrifice by saying, hey, the gods might like destroy the universe if we don't feed them these human sacrifices by the literally thousands um, uh, a year we have to sacrifice these people. Well, not everybody can do that, right? Who can organize a festival where you're going to pull the hearts out of maybe five to 10,000 people in one festival? It's a crazy festival, right? Who can do that but a state? So the state can claim legitimacy by being like, hey, if we don't do this, if we don't round up all these people that we can sacrifice, then the gods will just destroy us all. We have to make them happy. And so that gives the state some legitimacy. Um, in the East, in China, Confucianism will still reign. Okay, So please recognize, even as we get as late as the Qing Dynasty, and Confucianism is not really a religion, but it is certainly a, a way of life that has some very strict rituals that go along with it um, that, that, that will dominate Chinese um, politics. Society states also are going to use art and architecture to legitimize their rule. We want to think of construction like uh, the Taj Mahal, maybe. We want to think of construction like uh, St. Basil's Cathedral in Russia. We want to think of great palaces like the Palace of Versailles, that only a king can create something like that, right? Only a king like Louis XIV can create something like that. They also sometimes serve other purposes. For example, the Palace of Versailles. It's one way Louis XIV consolidated his power. How does he make sure people are following him? Well, he brings all the nobles to Versailles where he can keep an eye on them and they can't conspire against him or at least can't as easily conspire against him. Coolio? All right, beautiful. Um, be familiar with the big empires of this age. We've got some land-based empires. First, Russia. Uh, the Russian Empire is going to grow tremendously from 1450 to 1750. They start off at the beginning of this period by driving Mongols back. And then we have the earliest Russian czars and eventually the last Russian royal family, which is the Romanov dynasty, uh, that's going to take us all the way up until World War I. So the Russian Empire is going to grow tremendously as a land-based empire. In China, we will have the Ming and the Qing dynasties. The Ming being local Chinese that overthrow the Mongol rule, and then the Qing being outsiders that overthrow the Ming. In India, um, at the beginning of this period, we've got a Delhi Sultanate in the north. The Delhi Sultanate, it's an Islamic state in the northern part of India. And then by the 1600s, we've got the development of the Mughal Empire in India. Another one of these gunpowder empires along with the Safavid and the Ottoman Empire. Safavid and Ottoman Empire. Safavid and Ottoman Empire. Safavid is what is Persia. The Ottoman Empire further to the west there. These two are going to be tremendous rivals of each other, particularly because of their religious differences. There's a battle that they do meet at in the, in the border region of their two countries called the Battle of Calderan. And please notice the last four letters of the Battle of Calderan is Iran, and that might help us remember that that actually took place like right today where the border of Iran and Iraq are. Yes, ma'am. The Safavid and the Ottoman Empires. Safavid and the Ottoman Empires. No more Byzantine Empire to speak of, yes? Uh, the, the Ottoman Empire won, but it was really just a symbol of, of continual conflict between these two sides. It doesn't really have a massive impact on them. 
And then we got all those European states that are going to be venturing overseas. So the Spanish are going to create a massive empire in the Americas after the conquest of the Aztec and the Inca. We're also going to see a Portuguese empire in Brazil. We will see a Dutch empire, the Netherlands. The Dutch are going to control the islands of Indonesia over here. The British and the French will take tremendous holdings in North America. So the British, obviously, we know what they're holding on to, and then the French kind of get Canada and us here in Detroit. So we, these are our overseas empires that, that were conquered by European explorers. All right? Uh, let's uh, take some time. Any, any period for questions, comments, concerns, things you want to throw out, uh, things maybe a little foggy about, uh, anything that you're not quite remembering all the while? Yes, ma'am. What's the difference between the Mongols and the Ottomans? What's the difference between the Mongols and the Ottomans? It's the difference between uh, uh, apples and oranges. Like, so so they're, they're like completely different ethnic groups. Uh, the Mongols... The Mongols are uh, central, uh, originally Central Asian nomadic peoples uh, from further to the east. The Ottoman Turks are a Turkic people that kind of have their development in the eastern part of, of what is today the country of Turkey. Um, they exist at different time periods. They, they have no, there, there's no overlap whatsoever between what the Ottoman Empire is up to and what the Mongols are up to. Um, so, um, I guess similarity is that they both grow tremendously. Uh, they both like, and oh, then, okay, so here's the kind, you could get maybe a long essay question that's going to deal with something like this, where you've got initially, you're like, compare and contrast the method of, of rule for the Mongols and the Ottoman Empire. And your first gut reaction is to be like, oh, I don't know. And then you, like, get angry with me. You, like, go through, uh, whatever, the four or five stages of grief with regard to, uh, to, to having to deal with this question, right? You're angry. You're, you're, you're uh, going to curse me. You're, you're going to curse Mr. Crossan that we didn't do a good enough job for you, right? And then you might, like, try to bargain a little bit. Like, you start maybe praying or whatever you might do. And you're like, okay, God, please help me through this. And if you help me through this and to get at least a three, I'll be forever in your debt, right? And then um, you, like, you, you might just get sad and you're bummed out. And you're like, I'm going to fail. This is going to be the worst. And then you just accept what it's going to be. And you're like, hey, maybe I'm just a two. And once you get to that acceptance point, I hope you sit back and relax and breathe and say, I do know a lot of stuff. And, and when it comes to like comparing the methods of political rule of two states, Mongols and the Ottoman, you are allowed to say something like, they both had emperors that ruled them, right? They both used their militaries to expand tremendously. The, the Mongols expanded throughout um, um, most of Asia here. The Ottoman Empire is going to conquer Egypt, much of the Middle East, and get into Europe as well. So they're each going to trem uh, grow tremendously. They're each going to rule what they now create. I, I keep on calling massive multi-ethnic empires. They're going to rule massive multi-ethnic empires. But how are they going to rule them? Are they going to make everybody follow the Mongol way? Are, are, they, are people going to have to adopt the Mongol religion? No. No. You can be what you want to be. Mongols didn't really care. All the Mongols cared is that you would submit and pay your tribute. But beyond that, you want to be a Muslim, be a Muslim. In fact, many, Mo many Mongols are going to convert to Islam. The Mongols originally believed in like a shamanistic religion, uh, traditional of, of pastoral communities in Central Asia. Um, the Ottoman Empire, did they make everybody convert to Islam? Nope. The, Islam says there's no compulsion in religion. They don't make everybody convert to Islam. If you didn't convert, you might have had a little uh, tax that you had to pay. Um, but they didn't make everybody convert. In fact, they let Christians and Jews within the Islamic or within the Ottoman Empire do what they wanted to do and, and rule them their local communities the way they wanted to within that millet system. So you do know a lot of this stuff, all right? That, that's a great question. Um, I would say. Um, you know, they, they both could effectively employ, deploy weapons like gunpowder technology. Of course, the Ottomans is going to be much better because it's coming later, but the, the Mongols originally have it. Yes, ma'am? What's the difference between the Christian and the um, counter-revolution? Okay, um, so the, the, 
the Reformation, the Protestant Reformation begins in 1517 with Martin Luther nailing his 95 complaints onto the door of his church in Germany, right? And that was his 95 beefs against the Roman Catholic Church. And after he does this, after he does this, many Christ, many Catholics in Western Europe start to go the Lutheran way. They start to move towards Luther. And the Roman Catholic Church recognizes this as a problem because every but that goes to a Protestant church is one less but in a Catholic church, and that's one less person to pay uh, to, to give a donation to the Catholic church. So the Catholic church has to stop this flood of people leaving their church. And so they begin the counter-reformation. It's basically to counter, to go against the Protestant Reformation. And they, for example, end the practice of, of the selling of indulgences. That was one of the big arguments that Martin Luther had had. Right? They give more of a focus to religious education, um, um, not only in Europe, but also spreading Roman Catholicism. And conveniently for the Roman Catholic Church, what, what is starting to happen at the exact same time that the Protestant Reformation begins? Protestant Reformation begins in 1517, and a lot of European Christians are leaving. Well, what's happening at that same time? Well, Atlantic slave trade, sure, but, but the, the Americas are being taken over, right? And what's going to happen to a lot of Native Americans? What's going to happen to a lot of Africans, even, as Europeans are making their way into the Americas? They're going to convert them. So they're, lo- they're going to lose a lot of membership because of the Protestant Reformation, and then they gain a lot of membership because of European missionary activity, not only in the Americas, but also in Asia. What other kind of questions do you guys have? These are good. Yeah. John Calvin was um, just another one of these Protestant Reformation figures. Um, he is after Martin Luther. He's kind of based out of Switzerland. He's got his ideology of Calvinism, um, stressed the idea of predestination, that like before you were even born, your God has already scripted what's going to happen for you. You don't have any like ultimate choice in the path that you take. Whatever you end up is because God already predestined that to happen. Uh, John Calvin is probably a little bit more specific than you need to know. His name is not on the AP curriculum uh, for, for a figure that you need to know. Um, anybody, anything else? Yes, ma'am. The European gentry is just this new upper class that's going to develop in Western Europe. For almost all of human history, the wealthy people in the world were people that owned what? Land. Wealth always came from land. But after pretty much the 1450s, we're going to see something happen. One, a lot of that old traditional land ownership class, especially in Europe, they died in the the Black Plague. All right? And so now there's going to be... um, other things that people can actually develop a lot of wealth from. Beyond, the land is still going to be producing wealth, but you don't have to. Think about rich people today, right? Wealthy people today might own a house with some land. They might have a little cabin up north or something, but they're not getting their riches from the land. Where are they getting their riches? From the companies they develop, from the businesses they begin. Maybe they're in banking, maybe they're in manufacturing, or who knows whatever they're, they're into. But the wealth is going to come from places besides just what we can grow or take out of the land beneath us. And this creates a new gentry in Western Europe. Gentry just means rich folks. A new class of rich folks in Western Europe that are getting their wealth from beyond land ownership. All right? And that's why we're going to have the, the French Revolution. Okay, that's the next period. I don't want to talk about the French Revolution too much here. But, but something like the French Revolution. Remember we talked about the three estates of the French Revolution. First estate, the clergy. Second estate, the nobles. And then there's all the people. And for most of history and for most of the world, when we talk about like the church people and then the nobles and then everybody else, everybody else was always like poor. They were always the peasants, right? But now by the time we get to 1789... The everybody else includes a lot of wealthy, middle class, upper middle class people that they just don't have land. They don't own title to any land, but they still have a lot of wealth and power. And this is the 19th century when they're going to start saying, hey, we want some political voice. We pay most of the taxes, so we should have a say in how that, those tax dollars are being spent. Right? That's the new European gentry. 
All right. We use that word gentry also with regard to Chinese history and the scholar gentry. China has this idea that you can become important in society, not by just being rich, but by being an intellectual, by being able to pass the test and become a part of the bureaucracy. Any other period for questions? Yeah. Oh, good. That fit, that does fit in here. So um, Japan. Japan is going through in the previous period and and into this period. Japan is going through the same kind of feudalism that Western Europe is going through, right? Where landowners in Japan we call them daimyo are often in uh, rivalries with other landowners, other daimyo, other lords, um, and there's like constant fighting, constant warfare in in Japan. Um, that will come to an end with the victory of one ultimately all-powerful, and I don't have an exact year, I just call it 1600 because I don't have that exact year in my memory bank, uh, one all-powerful shogun, uh, like military leader in Japan named Tokugawa. Tokugawa Ayasu. Ayasu. Tokugawa Ayasu. Um, and this begins the Tokugawa shogunate where there's now only going to be one. He starts to centralize Japan. He ends Japanese feudalism, and he begins to centralize and make Japan kind of look more like the kingdoms of Western Europe, right? Kind of think of him as a king, right? There's still an emperor in Japan, but the emperor is just a figurehead. The emperor is just there because they've always had an emperor. He's, they believe he's a god on earth, but he has no political power. Tokugawa shogunate, or Tokugawa Ayasu has all the political power in Japan. He's also important because under his shogunate, he's going to force out of Japan Western influences. There were Christian missionaries in Japan trying to convert people. Uh, there were Christian business people, merchants in Japan trying to do business. Tokugawa Ayasu forces all of those business ideas into one little port city called Nagasaki in Japan. Nagasaki is the second city we dropped an atomic bomb on in 1945. So he forces them all into one centralized location so he can kind of better keep an eye on, on the Westerners. And he brings Japan a new period of isolation, like not being connected to the outside world. This is going to last, this Tokugawa shogunate is going to last for a couple centuries and only come to an end with the Meiji Restoration. The Meiji Restoration is basically Japan acknowledging we can't beat the West, so we should be like the West. And they reassert the authority of the emperor, and they start to modernize Japan. Cool? One other note under the Tokugawa uh, shogunate. The, who, who are those like knights, the, the warriors of feudal Japan? The samurai. Under Tokugawa's era, um, the samurai doesn't have as much role. Like, samurai are really important when you're constantly fighting civil wars. But when you're done fighting the civil wars, what do the samurai have to do? Not much. So Tokugawa Ayasu kind of turns the samurai class in, in Japan into more of a bureaucratic class. The, the samurai warriors now become essentially government bureaucrats. All right? They're very respected in society, so that helps you. It helps you rule. Cool.